Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a new dinosaur species have been discovered in Mongolia with extremely strange hands. Typhoons are launching microplastics onto land, a photo from the Hubble telescope and no more, actually. That's it, because it's the holiday season and it seems most people are on break. But we're still here to give you a roundup of a few things that have happened in science. Check out our video on the oldest evidence of humans creating fire to see Ben and me unbox the science field Winter Curiosity Box. And remember that there's a limited time sale on at the moment. Get a free box with a new subscription, so go and use our super special affiliate link down below to get yours now. Our top story this week is the naming of a new species of strange little dinosaur from Mongolia. This is a rather fantastic new species with some of the most unusual hand anatomy paleontologists have ever seen in one of these animals. Discovered in latest Cretaceous aged rocks in the Gobi Desert, approximately 66 million years old, this dinosaur is known from a partial skeleton. This skeleton includes parts of the backbone, pelvis, back legs and most importantly the forelimbs. The species has been given the name Manipulonyx reshitovi, a particularly appropriate name given the anatomy of the hands. Manipulonyx is a kind of theropod called an alvarosaurid, a lineage of little dinosaurs well known for their unusual hand anatomy. The most famous alvarosaurid is Mononychus, which has very stout, robust arms that bear a single enlarged functional claw. It was generally thought that all alvarosaurids had a single functional claw, with some having very reduced other digits and others lacking them entirely. The most widely accepted hypothesis was that these claws were used for scratch digging, likely to burrow into things like termite nests that the animals would then feed on with their elongate, quite tube-shaped snouts. But now, with the discovery of Manipulonyx, there's another idea about how these dinosaurs lived. This is the first time the entire hand of one of these dinosaurs has been discovered. In addition to the main enlarged claw, it turns out that it had two smaller but fairly well-developed digits next to the big one, plus three spikes on the hand. One of these spikes was positioned on the palm of the hand, while the other two projected out from the sides. So, this dinosaur was certainly manipulating something interesting with its hands. The paleontologists who described the new species hypothesized that this dinosaur and its relatives were not, in fact, digging out termite nests. Rather, they suggest that this anatomy is much more consistent with these alvarosaurids being egg eaters. The hands do appear to be perfectly suited to grasping onto the eggs of other dinosaurs, with the spikes being used to brace against the shell as the digits flexed. If this turns out to be confirmed by further fossil discoveries, then it would be quite the turn of events. Instead of the now outdated view of oviraptorosaurs being specialised egg thieves, which had been popularised for a long time in paleo media, it might actually have been the alvarosaurids who were the egg stealers this whole time. It's a really fascinating discovery, and what a way to end the paleontology news of 2025. Also in the news, a research team in China has carried out some fascinating research to find out if typhoons transport plastic from the ocean towards land and deposit it there. They collected atmospheric fallout every 12 hours in China as typhoons made landfall. Before each storm, microplastic deposition stayed low and steady, with the air mostly containing common urban plastics. When the typhoons arrived, everything changed. Deposition rates jumped by up to 10 times and then collapsing back to baseline once the storm passed. The types of plastic also changed. They found dense polymers, plastics which are normally found in marine sediments and deep ocean environments, not urban dust. Crucially, more than 60% of these particles were tiny at under 280 micrometers. Laboratory studies have shown that bubbles bursting at the sea surface, a process that increases dramatically with typhoon winds, preferentially launch particles smaller than 280 micrometers into the air. 
Wind trajectory models also have shown that the storm air travels directly over storm-disturbed ocean, not over inland landmasses. The scientists concluded that typhoons churn plastic up from the ocean depths, fling it into the air through violent wave breaking and bubble bursting, carry it inland on extreme winds, and then dump it onto land in the rain. Now, with our annual Christmas to New Year's drought of science papers being published, we haven't got a massive wealth of news to choose from, but NASA, clearly to help us out, have very kindly published a wonderful image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a region next to N159, a giant group of clouds in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a dwarf galaxy that orbits the Milky Way. It's about 150 light years across, which is small indeed in comparison to the Milky Way, which is 100,000 light years across. This particular region is a star-forming complex where dense clouds of cold hydrogen act as a nursery for newly formed stars to shine. Their radiation is what gives the surrounding gas its red tinge, with the brightest areas being those with massive hot young stars, which are so big they hollow out the area around them. All this material is being shuffled around by the young stars themselves and those still forming, showing just how much stars in different stages of life can interact with the material around them. Just this image alone can tell us so much about the Large Magellanic Cloud, star formation, and the early life of stars big and small. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, if you haven't seen the video over on the Benji Thomas channel about the speculative evolution of the Loch Ness Monster, we now have a revamped and much improved merch store, which will be linked down below. We're very pleased with our speculative Nessie design in particular. We're currently working on building a 7 Days of Science shop as well, and that should be up and running soon. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Kang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chappa Chappa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Batha, Diana Hernandez, Drove Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, Irage, Joyrun Joydevik, John French, Joseph Ree, Josh Lambert, Joshua, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Nikolaus York, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prietbrzyka Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikas, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, Tracy Merrifield, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next week.